Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. And this is part of the e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. And I'm excited. You know, today we have Richard Bacchus, and uh, he runs ABC Vacuum Warehouse and Green Steam with his dad, Ralph. How old's your dad now? My dad is 72. 72. ABC Vacuum started in 1977 as a mail order vacuum business, and they operate a brick and mortar store as well as a 20,000 square foot warehouse and employ 28 staff. And Green Steam, they've run since 2008, and it provides alternatives to harsh chemical cleaning products because after decades of experience in the retail floor business, they knew there was a better way, and they used German innovations to actually come up with the steam products to clean floors. So we'll talk about that too. Richard, thanks for joining me. Thanks. Great to be here. Now, this is exciting, and um, I always like to include a fun fact about someone so you know, it kind of makes it personal. And you have an in, one, probably one of the most interesting fun facts is is what about uh, you? I'm an avid roller skater. Roller skater, and what happened recently because of so, your roller skating escapades? Yeah, so uh, I I was getting into it uh, pretty well, and we were also doing some uh, light derby stuff, roller derby stuff, and uh, I broke my upper femur. Wow. Uh, after being taken out by another competitor, so so was the goal of the roller derby to get what is the is it to get around as many times as possible? What is the goal? It is so you you've got a person who is is trying to lap the other team and get through their defenses, and that's how you score. So, uh, but sometimes it's not about that. Sometimes it's about also just kind of like exacting a little revenge. Sometimes. <laughs> so what uh, happened when you broke your your femur? And that's serious. Yeah, so what happened was it was actually kind of a freak thing. Um, both of my skates got taken out, so the guy actually fell. He, he was coming in to hit me, but he actually tried to slide and he fell. Both skates kicked up. I did upended, came down on top of his skate, and it kind of cracked my legs. So. Oh, my gosh. But, How painful is that? You know, you go into shock. You don't even think about it. So yeah. I got carted out. I, as far as I can remember, I think I'm the only person that ever got like, carted out completely <laughs> with uh, with something like that. But... We, uh, you know, went through like a 16-week recovery process, and I'm back out there now. Yeah. So you employ these intensity the, with uh, the e-commerce business too, right? Well, yeah. You know, I'm competitive, but the but that's more of a steam. That's more of a release kind of thing. You know, a, a, a safety valve to get rid of stress and things. Like yeah. That. So I want to I want to hear about the beginnings and the transitions of ABC Vacuum, um, but first I want to talk about you had a lot of big influences growing up. You know, obviously your dad was a big influence. What did you learn from him when you were growing up? Well, growing up, uh, you know, he's, he actually, you know, I was fairly young when we started the company. So yeah. I remember all the little things from, you know, painting the walls, clearing the stuff out, always doing work, that type of thing. Uh, I was one of these few kids that had money when, you know, he'd pay me a little bit for doing things. Well, I always had money, you know, so um, – Hard work was always a, just a, a, a yeah. given component. We just never even thought about that. But at the same time, my father was always very uh, willing to try new things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, somebody was he, – he'd say, you know, you fail five times for that one thing that's going to work, you know. Mm -hmm. So always uh, innovating any little way he could. If there was a way to, that everybody's selling something a certain way, let's try it just a little bit different, you know. Yeah. And uh, I just grew up with that. So it was just yeah. kind of instilled in me. What did you see him trying that sticks out to you? Uh, one thing in particular was in, in our front of our, our vacuum store, he, uh, he saw the sign. I don't know where he saw it or how he got connected with it, but it was basically a mechanical gorilla. So it was like a full size gorilla, uh, sitting there. And I remember thinking like, why would you put a gorilla in front of the store? <laughs> and as soon as he did it though, I, it was, it was obvious because every car going by would honk. Uh, I mean, so here's this little tiny store with really no signage. But there was a grill out front. <laughs> and uh, Was this on the outside of the store or the inside window? It was on the outside of the store by the street. Oh, wow. Because he checked with the local signage and they didn't really have a way to say – there was nothing in there saying you can't put a mechanical grill out there. They didn't have a law yet um, until they just made one after your dad did that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so 
uh, this was a big attention getter. Well, next thing you know, everybody'd come in with a smile on their face. They'd make a comment about it. Uh, yeah. They'd bring their kids by that type of thing. So I remember thinking, like, wow, that was really smart to do that. Even though that was just kind of outside the box, thinking like, how can I draw attention to this little store, you know, and get right. more traffic in there? How do you think he thought of that? What what gave him the idea for a mechanical gorilla? I don't know. Um, you know, I'm, I mean, too many vodka tonics, maybe. I don't know, <laughs> but. <laughs> Uh, but he was always he was always thinking like that. Let's just try something different. Let's try something new. Where was the first store? Uh, first store was in Burnett Road in Austin here. Okay, and uh, it was a converted bait shack, like you know where these places where you go to buy bait to go sure, fish. Sure, sure. Like that it was very small, eight hundred square feet, and um, if you had to, we had to work on things in front of the customers. So if we had to do repairs or anything like that. The customers were standing right next to us, you know, so right. very cramped space. But uh, he he really worked hard to move out of that, and we moved to a larger place down the street, and uh, that's where we really started to do all of our mail mail order operations and all that kind of stuff. Really started to flow because we were doing as much out the back door as we were the front door always. So why vacuums? Vacuums. He got involved selling. Uh, he was working with Hoover and then Eureka as a sales rep. And so uh, one thing, he just started making contacts, connections, actually started selling these uh, vacuums called Rainbows and Kirby's that uh, were sold door to door at the time. Right. Well, he knew the guys selling them and they would occasionally say, hey, would you mind buying a few of these off of me so I can make a sales quota? <laughs> and so he thought, yeah, but what am I going to do with them? And then he thought, you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll take out a classified ad and sell it. That would be the equivalent of today of like putting something on Craigslist, let's say. Right, right. And so he did that, and I remember I remember seeing him do that all the time, and going, you know, I'd, I'd ride with him to go get these things from the guys, and uh, that was basically the old internet, you know. So the, what did he do? He would find was there specific magazines that he found worked, or what, you know? Yeah, he started advertising. He started trying different magazines with these little small classified ads. He'd do local as well, but started doing national ones. Hmm. And when he started doing the national ones, the demand went up. So that's when he started learning things about email lists and, or I'm sorry, not email lists, but actual mail lists at the right. time, and how to organize those, categorize those, hit them periodically, yeah. um, change your offers up, A/B test them. Does he still? Do you still do ads in magazines? We don't. No. Oh, okay. Don't, don't. I was just asking so you can share some of the some of the details because you know you don't want to get competitors out there. But since you you aren't doing it anymore, no, what no. were the what did, what did the ads say? Because obviously he drew response. Yeah, so the and ads would you, would he write them also, or would he hire someone? No, he he would write them himself. Yeah, and he put them in. They would basically just be a, a small ad saying, you know, you can get this. Uh, there's some he'd have some kind of like urgent or seasonal lead in. Yeah, and uh, then it would just give the price. Yeah, and then where to do the inquiry to, and these these inquiries would come in by mail. We'd save their addresses, sort them, and keep them, and then we would hit them periodically. With better offers, A B testing, like I said. And uh, what was so great back then was when people would order them, you get these checks in the mail. Right. So every day you come and hit the mail and see their inquiries or it's money, you know? And so What was uh, the they, what was the offer? Like you said, like uh, could could people was the offer to buy one or for like what would they in, inquire about? Yeah, so what it would be would um, Do you remember would, the ad? Like I'm curious of what exactly it said, like what the headlines okay, said, well, because it obviously pulled, you know, response. Some of them were a little more creative than others, yeah. but one of them was uh, so you got to remember that like a Kirby vacuum was probably about at that time eight hundred dollars new, right? And so he would advertise this for say four hundred dollars, and it would say divorced, <laughs> uh, need to sell brand new Kirby. No one even questioned that if you say divorce. So he, so they would instantly send this in and inquire about it. Uh, you know, but because it was kind of cute, people would get okay. This is a this is a business or whatnot. That's fine. Right. Uh, so they would usually get a chuckle out of it. But but you'd see that word divorced, you know, in all bold black, and it would just attract your eyes. And you're like, I need to know more about. Oh wow, that's a great price on that vacuum cleaner. You know. Right. So um, that would be an example of one way he was doing it to kind of like lead generate or yeah. get uh, or get a sale direct. You know, right there. So. So the offer was it would say the the price like what would what would an inquiry letter that you get look like? Well, an inquiry letter would just be like you know we're needing some more information on this. So you're oh, I got gotcha. you. Kind of they weren't like ready to buy, but they were like wanting to know more information. 
That's right. And then we would send them a brochure out. We'd send them some information on it, you know, which gives them a little bit more about it. But then we got them on the list. And so, you know, we'd hit them once a quarter with a new offer if they didn't buy. Was there a number on there or did people just uh, send in letters at the time? Well, it was mailing at first. Now, once we expanded our operation, we, we got an 800 number. And so then they could they could call in direct. And so uh, doing everything in fulfillment that way, you know, originally this is this is also funny. Yeah. My grandparents did the shipping, so <laughs> really, so my, these orders would come in, and then my grandmother would take them and go and ship them out the back. Now, uh, by 1985 or 86, we'd actually a little more of an operation where we had a shipper and everything like that. So, yeah. So what other headlines worked? I'm, I'm a like direct response junkie. I love hearing this stuff. You know, so the divorced worked. What other creative headlines did he come up with? Um, things like arrested. Um, uh, there was. Uh, <laughs> so what? How did he tie arrested? Robbery. Wa- robbery was one. Don't be robbed. That kind of thing. You know, because the, the just price anything is to so stand out from just the, the sea of, you know, the sea of stuff that was in there. Because it was so cheap. That's how he, he used that. Divorce was the best one, though. Divorce was the best one. So what magazines did he yeah. target? How did he know which magazines? Because there's a million magazines out there. Yeah. Um, he would, he tried a lot of different ones. Uh, Southern Living. There was one called Progressive Farmer. Some of these were fairly targeted. But uh, also, in, um, there was a while there where People Magazine would have, you know, we got more on a national level. They did have classifieds in the back, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. And so did you ever end up buying lists since you found that these lists worked well? No, no. this solely, solely generated on our own. And, uh, he, he would go through like I said, and just, uh, treated them like gold, you know? So the way, if you have a really good email list today, you know, it's the same way you, yeah. you do it, you do it the exact same way. Yeah. So what would you do now? You compile the list of potential buyers. What would you do? What would you send out in the future? Once you had that list. Yeah. So if they did an initial inquiry, we would, we would send them out a seasonal thing, say, you know, uh, everything from again, something to kind of get their attention, you know, notice potential price increase coming. Uh, this is a, something you can get in on right now, that type of thing. And then once we had them, uh, once they purchased, we'd put them on a yearly basis, then update, you know, so that in case they had somebody they knew or something like that, you know, referral discount, you know, da, 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 da. And give them that, you know, here's a price for this if there's somebody you know. So we never, ever got rid of the entire list. Once you were on the list, you'd get something at least once a year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, But until you bought, you'd get hit once a quarter. Yeah. So at what point did you stop doing the magazine ads? Um... Yeah. So this, so really what happened is um, in 1995, that that went on for a good 10 years. Yeah. That's a long time. Yeah. And we were definitely the largest independent vacuum uh, mail order. There was no doubt about that at the time, but this thing called the internet came along, <laughs> and my, I remember my father. I was actually working at Papa John's Pizza at the time, so yeah. I'd gone off, got my degree. I'm doing marketing and all this other stuff for them, opening up in areas. And um, he called me and said, I, "I went to this webinar or the seminar about getting on the web." And I was like, "What? Why are you going to do that? That's that's like..." that's for books or information, you know? And I said, we're having to do this online ordering thing. It's a pain. You wouldn't believe it. You know? And he's like, he's like, cause yeah, you knew, you knew from Papa John's. Yes. Like, yeah. Oh, and it was a nightmare. Cause, uh, uh, John Schneider, the owner of Papa John's at the time and CEO, he had this vision that this was going to be the way people were going to order pizza. Well, yeah. we were on 14 K modems back then, you know, it just was not working out. And this, it was so slow and people ended up calling us anyway. And we could just take their, their order so easily over the phone. You know, we were set up for that. And, uh, and then these orders would pop in operationally and people wouldn't know what to do with them. And it was always a mess. And, but he was adamant about it. Yeah. Like, he's, no, this is going to work. Make it work. Make it work. Make it work. Mm. So, uh, you know, I worked a lot with the IT department on that. So I got very close with them. Yeah. And we would constantly be trying to figure out how to get this in operation. So my job was trying to figure out how to make it work in operationally. Well, along the way, I learned how to do some things like build shopping carts. I learned how to build, right. you know, uh, presentation areas with photos and things like that. And this like is that. what year? What year is this about? That's 95 to 96. 95, yeah. So this is pre-Google, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is back when Yahoo ruled. Yeah. That's so, wild. Yeah, yeah so, so go on. Yeah. 
So anyway, uh, once he got the website, we basically put our catalog on the web. And uh, all I had was a phone number and price listings and, and everything else because we were selling more than just the Kirby's at that point. We were selling a, a wide array of vacuum yeah. cleaners. And um, well, once that happened, the phone started to ring nonstop. So really? we, were one of, we were one of two people selling vacuum cleaners online. And he That's contacted, crazy, right? He contacted me at Papa John's and then was like, you got to come work for me. I was like, I'm never going to work for you, Dad. Forget it. <laughs> It's not going to happen. Like I remember painting stuff and you gave me two cents. Or yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I was like, you know, it's just he's like, oh, you know, come on. I don't know because this web stuff, it's getting away from me. I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, so I was like, all right, I'll, I'll tell you what. I got a sabbatical coming up. I'll work on it a little bit. We'll, we'll check it out. So the first thing I did, I said, you got to get a shopping cart in here. You got to get some better photos. It's like, can you do all that? I was like, all right, I'll do it. And once that happened, yeah. the phone got even worse. Um, operations were breaking. They they couldn't handle the operations. So I spent my last weeks of uh, my sabbatical there fixing operational stuff and getting shipping all that. They didn't have a network in place. I had to put in a computer network for them. <laughs> I mean, who who had one then? Hardly anyone. Like Yahoo had one, right? I mean, right. People just weren't used to doing local area networks or having yeah. them set up for being web enabled or anything yeah. like that. I mean, all of our UPS tracking and everything was still done on hand tickets. I mean, wow. Uh, there was no uploading and all the downloading, that type of thing. So yeah. literally had to create everything uh, e-commerce wise. I had a little bit of a head start coming from where I was coming from and having such a, a leader that was so crazy about making that work. Right. So the translation was actually pretty seamless when we yeah. switched from catalog over to internet because operationally I already knew what to do. We already had that stuff in place. I just had to upgrade it, computerize it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're trying to hear about some of the lessons of Papa John's. But, but first I have to go back. So early on... Like when your dad asked you that, you said, no way I'm working for you. Mm -hmm. What did you want to be when you grew up? Because obviously your dad has been in this business for a long time. Yeah, I knew I wanted to be in business, but uh, I wasn't quite sure where. And my path just took me into Papa John's very quickly because this I was trying to pay back my student loans. And I started delivering pizza. And I saw this Papa John's open up. Well, it turned out to be the very first one in Texas. Wow. It was being overseen by the VP of the company. So I got to work initially right there next yeah. to him and he saw that I was interested in more than just delivering pizzas right so uh, I kind of got fast-tracked wow. and um, uh, on a lot of fronts it, it was kind of a whirlwind a uh, few years there it's like luck timing and hard work all kind of came together because everything yeah. yeah if the VP wasn't there he wouldn't <laughs> have you wouldn't have met him you know wouldn't have met him and so there so he knew me and so there was always this kind of you know a contact that I had there right so I always stayed a little bit outside just the normal operations, always attending new store openings, working with franchisees, uh, you know, since I did the initial marketing, working with marketing plans. Yeah. So there was always these little things there that was always uh, working in Louisville directly with the corporate as well. Mm. So what worked with opening these new franchises? You mean like how did, in, how in did the it... the pizza uh, places. Yeah, because you'd have to be, you know, kind of coordinating the marketing, right, for these new businesses. Yes. So basically, you'd have to go in. You'd have to have a very strong marketing plan, uh, a lot of local direct stuff. Mm -hmm. Like what? Then, what does that mean? Like, like hanging door hangers on people's doors, mm. things like that. Just making sure that there was, you know, mail pieces, um, all that kind of thing. There was even some telemarketing, a yeah. little bit of that. So a lot of grassroots, like local stuff, making people aware. Oh yeah, big time, big time. And then uh, the big the other component with that was when they order, you want to make sure that they were getting the best experience possible. So making sure that everybody was trained properly, pro uh, the product was perfect. Uh, so that was another thing. So I had all this experience and training and getting these people, you know, the entire staff up to speed. Uh, so much I even ran their corporate store uh, in Austin where everyone would come visit to see a model store. Mm. So we would no pressure you know, there. No pressure there, but you know I handled that. I, that part was actually easy because it wasn't a real busy store, you know. <laughs> So, so then what did you do? What were your responsibilities when you got to corporate? Um, like I said, it was mostly that. So mm -hmm. it's, it was always split between training, marketing, and actual operations. So uh, when you kind of get, you, you get pegged for a new store opening, they want you to always do that. That's, yeah, that's I see. Always, it's got to be one of the work. toughest positions, actually. It's like the other stuff's running smoothly, and then the new store – you have to really jumpstart everything. You do. And then, then you also, before you, you want to make sure everything's humming before you hand it to somebody. 
So then you know, those guys come in and every once in a while you got to go back, you know, and, and re, you know, fix everything, make sure everything is going good again. But um, but the real the one of the things, like I said, right before I left there, was this online ordering. People yeah. were really upset about it. You know, uh, it just wasn't working. They were trying and, to do it and it just wasn't functioning. Is that why? Didn't, didn't function. I mean, well. how many people are really online? I'm surprised that that it was working so well because I think at that time most people aren't even online. Well, they there was quite a few people online, but again, it, it was slow internet speeds. Yeah, you know, we're talking 30, 40 seconds to download a photo. You know that type of that type of thing, and that's if everything is working. Now good, we you know? would throw our computer against the wall if it took like oh, that you, amount of time. You were lucky to get through an order placement and not get kicked off the internet three or four times while you were doing it. You know, right? <laughs> Just getting kicked off all the time. Uh, but uh, there were people that were trying to be online. I mean, that's when AOL was big, and I think you know, so people were kind of getting into the, that and messaging and stuff like that. But uh, but actually trying to get through an order process. This is what you know. E-commerce was not really viable at the time. Right. Uh, so I remember even me, I, I had a, I had a really good connection, but it was still a dial up. You had to like dial it up, wait for the protocols to exchange. Doo -doo, you know, right, it was like, stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but you know, it was, uh, that, that's the problem. So in the, imagine in the middle of a dinner rush, people are calling the phones are, are smoking, you know, everybody's banging out pizzas and they're trying to get them out. The drivers are all trying to figure out where they're going. And all of a sudden here's this order that just pops in and it's all messed up. <laughs> You know, and they're like, oh, we got to call that customer. You know, is there a phone number? No, we have an email. Oh, you know, <laughs> we got to do this whole thing back and forth. And then, uh, you know, and then they or they call up anyway going, yeah, I don't think I added my drinks to that order. Like, which one was? Oh, we don't know. It's not really in our system correctly. And we have to go figure it out. So it was always an operational problem. People mm -hmm. hated it. You know, so just a couple of orders a night could really screw up things. And um so it was a lot of challenges and just when you'd go on there, it might take you 15 minutes to place the order because the menus were so slow and they weren't really right. standardized at the time. You know, people didn't really know how to make menus at the time. So, uh, but, but just operating from that standpoint, always having to have input into it and give feedback and then work with these guys, these programmers on how that's supposed to happen yeah. and doing some of it myself. Uh, I was used to trying, I was, actually got used to working in a space where there wasn't really a model. You know, so we're trying to do something. Right. There's no standardized way of doing it. We're kind of making it up as we go. Uh, kind of put me in a different mindset for how to approach these things. So what is your mindset for approaching these things? Uh, it's always thinking outside the box. And my mindset's always coming from the perspective of the, of the user, the person who's actually doing it. Right, right. So how, do, how does that make it easier for them? What are they looking for? What are they thinking? What's going through their mind? Where are their eyes going? What are they following? Mm -hmm. Does this color make a difference to them or not? You know, that type of thing. Right. Uh, because literally, you know, back then there was no standardized way of doing it. So you had to come up with yeah. something. So, so like, what lessons did you learn from John at Papa John's? It seemed like he knew this should be the way and it sounds like a visionary in a lot of respects. Yeah, so one thing about him was uh, he was also fiercely competitive. Uh, one of the things he liked to do when he would come visit us was uh, he liked to go play laser tag. <laughs> now, this guy was serious about laser tag, let me tell you. <laughs> he had the full, like, hood suit. He had the black tights, all this kind of stuff. He, he wanted to be <laughs> as invisible as he could be. And he was not afraid to go around and take everybody out. And he did not take offense. You know, a lot of people thought, oh, should I, like, actually try to kill him? I'm like, no, try to kill him. He's hard, it's hard to kill, let me tell you. So uh, so he, he had a real competitive nature no matter what he did. Uh, but he also – he also was also very much looking into the future. So yeah. uh, he was very adamant about things like ingredients and how they were made and uh, almost obsessive. Uh, and the board didn't like that. A lot of people didn't like that. So two things I learned about him is it's not afraid to be an innovator and have arrows on your back because you're going to, you're going to get them. You know, if you do something new or different and you have any success at it, yeah. they're coming for you. Yeah. So, so just get ready for that. That's actually your sign that you know you're doing it right. So if you're not, you know, I used, we used to have this say, saying that if we're not pissing somebody off, we're not doing the right thing. So <laughs> as long as you're, as long as you're keeping headstrong about it and you can see it and you know it's what you want to do, it may not always be right, but that's how you get things yeah. done and that's how you do new things. What did you think he saw about the internet at that point where you're so adamant, even though everything was breaking and it was actually causing more issues in the stores? 
Uh, sorry, I didn't get that last part. Oh, I said, you know, what do you think he saw about the internet that made him so adamant to do it, even though it was breaking more things and causing more of a uh, you know slowdown in the stores? You know, this is something he probably will never get true credit for because they'll just think of him as the pizza guy, but he did see that as a modern way of communication. So um, he he just actually had that vision where he saw this is the way people are going to be doing it. And actually yeah. now that is the way everybody does it. Yeah. I mean, everyone orders online. I mean, they pull out their phone, yeah. hit that, here comes the pizza. I mean, I'm, so. It was interesting because when your dad told you, you were in the middle of all of it. And you still said, don't do it. It's horrible. <laughs> yeah. You still didn't see the vision even though you were in it. I still didn't at that moment. Yeah. No. So so what did your dad – yeah, so I'm curious because you saw so many issues with it mm -hmm. you know, at the time. And so when your dad told you we want to do this thing, what, what did he ask you to do? Was it just to put up a website or did he want to actually do e-commerce? He told me he was going to put up a website. Okay. Like I'm doing this. What's your opinion of all this, you know, kind right. of thing. And I basically told him, it's like, I, we can barely get people to order, you know, buy a pizza on the web, much less, I can't imagine them buying a vacuum cleaner or something like that. Right. And so. Which um, is pretty logical. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I was just, I was just being realistic with him at the time, you know. And then, uh, but when these things started to sell, I started to get it. And then I started to see where this thing was going. Yeah. And uh, it became very clear to me that there was a whole new way of buying things coming up. Yeah. And doing it online, it was going to be much more than, than chat rooms or looking up information or, you know, that kind of stuff, trying to download. You know, we knew Amazon was selling books at the time. But that was about it. So as far as people actually buying things, because of our background in mail order, it's like this light bulb went off with me and I went, no, mail order is a big thing. The Internet is mail order. So as people are looking around, this is a new way to present things to people. Right. It's the same kind of uh, not not coming from a mail order background that that uh, John Schnatter saw with the online ordering. He was seeing it as just basically a new way for people to communicate. So he wanted to make sure they were able to do it. He actually experimented with faxing before that. Hmm. So <laughs> where people would what fax. What do you do? Them. Yeah. Oh, he'd fax yeah, it. So, so we'd have these fax orders that would come in just because if people wanted to do a fax, they could do that. So they'd have a little sheet they'd just fill out. But um, but what I was seeing is that people could do the same things with vacuum cleaners. So what we wanted to do was solve a problem. One of the problems was we noticed people would go online to do research. So instantly I saw that what we needed to have was some type of medium for them to do research. So we actually had this little uh, – this thing we started called Help Me Select a Vacuum, which was basically a, a questionnaire that you would walk through somebody on a sales floor. So if somebody was on a sales floor, there's questions you ask them to get a feel for what they're needing. Right. I just put them online and let people answer them. It was amazing how many people would fill this out and send this in telling you, you know, I've got pets, I've got kids, I've got stairs, I've got, you know, they tell you all this stuff. Well, we'd have enough information that we'd send them some suggestions back so they'd narrow their search. They're not just out there looking at every item. Right, right. We had a 50% conversion rate on that form. 54%. 50%. Wow, wow that's amazing. Yeah, it was it was incredible. We'd give them two or three suggestions; they would buy one of those uh, every wow. two emails that we'd get. So, anyone who doesn't have one of these things walking people through should. Well, this whatever is first, product it is, this is the one of the early forms of social proof. Yeah. So, uh, social proof is basically now we rely on reviews. We rely on you know we relied on things like Consumer Reports to narrow our selections down. Uh, how do we get the, you know, seeing, you know, 500 products down to the two that I want to consider? Right. And so what we did was we, we just helped narrow that. We just did a fast track through filters. We did a fast track by just answering them directly. Yeah. And so that's why it was so successful. Well, from that, I knew how we needed to develop our website and everything else. Yeah. So how did your dad convince you to come work with him? Because you have a good <laughs> job at Papa John's and he's like... We're swamped, but that, that still could be like, you know, dad, just hire someone to do this. What made you decide to actually make the leap and work with them? Well, what he said was, if you will come on board, I'll just give this to you. Give what? <laughs> the, the internet side of the business. To oh, oh, wow. Okay. 
which he didn't at the time. <laughs> it's like, read the fine print. Right, read the fine print. Because once it got going, he's like, oh, I never said that. But no, we, uh, we, we've always, we've had a great working relationship. You know, early on, it was a little more like American Chopper. I don't know if you remember that series on Discovery. I didn't but, watch uh, it. Yeah, we, well, it's the, it was a father-son thing, and, and like we would fight, and we'd fight in front of the employees, and I was like, I think we should do this. Oh, you're not doing that. No, forget it. You know, that kind of thing. And um, Scare but, everyone. Yeah. But as, the, as things kind of evened out, you know, there was a mutual respect there. One, I respected his conservatism, you know, for, for building a company, you know, making sure I didn't get too crazy or we just started, started spending, you know, on crazy things. Yeah. But at the same time, he respected my vision and where I saw things were going and the risk that we needed to take at times. And since he had a little bit of that in him anyway, uh, we really worked well together as a collaboration. So we're probably one of those rare family teams that act, actually really works well together. So what was something big that you fought about at the time? I remember we fought over a Google AdWords bill that came in. It was $40,000. Okay. A month. <laughs> and was he going to strangle you or what, what happened there? Well, what it was was there was this little company called Dyson that just started. Right. And... The ROI. They really was, just started. Dyson had just started at the time. They just started. Oh wow! And I, w we were on the ground floor with them, so we had their products. And I thought, you know, I'll throw them in Google AdWords, and we'll uh, we'll see what happens. Well, the problem was was that people were curious about them, not ready to buy. They just wanted to know what was up with this Dyson name, mm. and so they were doing. They were hitting the clicks for research, mm. and they weren't converting. And this went insane. So um, I had a wide budget, but my wide budget was based on ROI. So. Uh, that month we didn't have a return on investment. It was like forty thousand dollars. We had a big fight about that, like what to do about it. And I was like, this just tells me that we need to get more involved in Dyson. This means we need to go head first into them. And uh, and he fought about that. He's like, yeah, but then nobody's buying the things. They're just like you know wasting all this money. And then you know, so we were going back and forth about it. Well, now it turns out I was right. So. <laughs> So then, what do you do with that information? So now you go. We have to get more into Dyson. So what do you actually do? So what I did was um, we started a, a stronger relationship with them, started buying more of their product, uh, then started experimenting through channels like eBay, that type of thing. We experimented with refurbished product. Mm -hmm. Refurbished product did really well. Um, so we went that direction a little bit more. And uh, I, kept, I, I made a proposal. I sent it to John, James Dyson for us to be the exclusive eBay dealer mm. for Dyson. And it was firmly rejected. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, how'd you pull that off? Yeah. Well, you know, you, you just, you always throw something out there. It's words, right? So we, uh, we tried it, but the thing is it got, it got in the ear of the management down the chain. So as they started to have problems with the eBay rogue sellers, things like that, not really sure what to do with it. Uh, they kept calling me back, you mm. know, and going, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Can we do this? Can we do that? So as they're evolving, going through phases, we were started to help shape that a little bit. And I remember we had a little falling out at one point, and I was like, okay, we're not selling dice anymore. Forget it. I'm tired of messing with those guys. And uh, Rep called me back, and he's like, look, can you do this? Just just put your stuff up for a month and sell it any way you want to. I'm not going to restrict you at all. Just sell it any way you want to. I went, no, I said, I don't, I'm already geared down from that. I don't want to do it. <laughs> Why would I want to do it for a month if I can't, you know, Right, keep it? right. So two weeks into that, he calls, he calls me back. He says, hey, are you going to do this or not? I'm really telling you, you need to do this. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do it. I, I, I said, all right. My father comes in. you like, hey, that guy keeps bugging me. Will you just do that? <laughs> so I was like, all right, all right. So I put everything up. I start selling everything, sell everything for two weeks, and then take it all down. The guy calls me up and said, uh, how would you like to be the exclusive Dyson dealer? I go, you mean what I've, always, what I've been asking for for the last two years? And he goes, yeah, yeah, we can do it. I was like, why the change of heart? And he said, this last sale, he goes, you spent two weeks selling, and uh, I didn't tell you, but I had five other guys selling against you. And I was like, oh, really? I didn't. I mean, I don't know. I just did my own thing. And he said, yeah, well, you outsold all them uh, four to one. Wow. And he goes, you were only doing it for two weeks. They did it for the full month. And I went, oh, okay. He goes, he goes I, got, I got it passed. No problem now. So, <laughs> so we became so the So what did you do that outsold them so much? Um, well... I had a few different tech sales techniques that I did back then. I just allowed whatever they'd last to do. And specifically what I did was I was running auctions and I would run them staggered. And at the end, I would have a buy it now with multiple quantities into it. So as the auction would end, the people that didn't win the auction could just slide it to buy it now and pick it up. And I would do that on, you know, three, six and nine. Uh, and I'd run multiple listings. 
Now, if I had a lot of competition coming in, I would just increase my listings so that we would slowly start to kind of drown them out. We would appear to be the most dominant seller. And then also made sure that our, um, our seller ratings were impeccable. So we've been over backwards for customer issues, that type of thing. So right. if you saw those great ratings from us and then we're kind of dominating the listings, it was a no-brainer. So they jump in an auction. We draw them in with an auction and then throw them to the buy it now. Now everything is, now everything is different. It's mostly buy it now. But yeah. back then we leveraged the power of the auction. Which the other guys weren't doing. They they would just had listings up. They weren't trying to. Uh, they weren't trying techniques. They weren't trying to make their listings better, make them stand out. Yeah. That's the thing else I would do too. Is I would I would utilize the uh, promotional tools that eBay would give us, whether it was a bold listing or anything like that. I would always I'd always A B test those all the right. time to see what worked better for what products, and uh, on the particular products that they allowed me to sell, I already knew I knew what promotional vehicles were going to work best. So yeah, that's amazing. So was it the Dyson thing? Were they just limiting you too much? Is that what kind of you, you were kind of fed up with playing like within a certain rule set? Well, they had usually refurbished product doesn't have minimum advertised pricing. They decided to experiment with minimum advertised pricing. Okay. And I already told them it was going to be a failure. Right. And then it turned out it was a failure. Yeah. <laughs> so while they did that, I was just tired of them trying to figure their own way out. Yeah. And so we just we just pulled off, and I was like, yeah. I'll concentrate on other places. Yeah. Because so, why wouldn't they just have okay? Why why not just have you and everyone else selling on on eBay? You know, just say okay. Like, why did they make you the exclusive dealer? Yeah, you outsold them, but they still probably got some sales from the other people. Yeah, so us being an approved dealer made it so that we actually could do extra warranty for the the buyer. We could actually uh, have more buyer protection for them, approved by Dyson by saying we're the exclusive approved dealer for right, them right. on eBay. Yeah. So the other thing that we did is we had access to their actual uh, copyrighted material. So you'd see the actual Dyson material. Yeah. People who didn't have that, their listings could be taken down yeah. or they had to like just take some photo from something in an aisle in a store somewhere. So it wouldn't look as professional. So if they did buy from somebody else, they would know that they one, their warranties weren't covered. Um, this was not approved by Dyson, that we were the guys who were already vetted by them. Yeah. So we're going to talk about some of the transitions. So you talked about the physical store to the mail order and magazines and then now to website. Um, what was one of the big milestones? So your dad brought you on and mm -hmm. then the website was, was doing amazing, right? Mm -hmm. So what was some of the big milestones initially when you first uh, had put up the website? Uh, when we first put it up, um, I did two things that we probably started to see five to six times ROI was um, I got rid of this this really slow graphic that that was on the front page. Mm -hmm. the, the web designers would put this really slow loading graphic, which was also an image map for navigation. So you couldn't go into the website until this thing downloaded. Yeah. It took about 45 seconds. <laughs> yeah. I removed that. You always then, look at the user experience, it seems like. Always the user yeah. experience. Yeah. So I, remo I removed that. And uh, got it to where there was an in I just actually it was simple. I put an enter button at the bottom that was graphical or uh, textual. So while you're waiting for this download, you had this enter button just saying enter. Well, no one waited for that anymore. I, I was watching the analytics. Once I put that in, people were in within three seconds. So mm. now they're in navigating and looking. Mm. And um, the next thing was was adding photos, which that's that was shown early on that if you the more photos that you have of a product, the more engaged people get. Yeah more comfort, comfortable they feel about it. And we just didn't have high res back then. We had to go with low res. But still, we had photos. And uh, then once we got the shopping cart installed, shopping well, cart What did people big. use for shopping cart? I mean, did you do something custom? Or was there something off the shelf that you could use at the time? I found a really smart guy here in Austin. He had to build it for me. And yeah. He built it from scratch. Yeah. And over the course of about three to four years, you would see programming notes in the code from about four or five different people because it took multiple people to, to construct a shopping cart that would work. We weren't worried about security back then even. It was just, can it work right? You know, is it is actually pulling from the database and getting in there. Uh, they were very rudimentary at first, like just drop down menus that would show, pick your product as drop down menu and, and stick it in there kind of yeah. thing. So getting to the point where we actually had a button on the product was a big deal. Yeah. So what do you use today for those, for the shopping cart and, I use Big Commerce. It's a full blown package. They've already standardized everything. I don't have to worry about anything. Why Big Commerce as opposed to any of the other 
other ones? Uh, the two that I recommend are Big Commerce and Shopify. Yeah. And the reason being is they've got so much built into the back end also for the multi-channel s- seller. So if you want to sell on eBay or something like that, it's kind of seamless. Now, they'll get your products on there. Now, it's up to you to promote them differently or work on your listings. But if uh, it's, it just makes it so that it's so much easier. If you want to do um, any type of chat programs, it's an app you put in now. Right. You know, you just it's ready to go. You just right. throw it on. If you want to uh, get involved in, um, you know, affiliate marketing, it's it's an app, and then you fill out your information, and you're going in like a day. So, right. uh, they're just they take care of that that complicated back end. We were with Magento for a while. You yeah. still have to have a full time developer. Yeah. You know, it's not cheap. It's very expensive. Uh, things don't work right. They're buggy. All that kind of stuff. You go with somebody like uh, Shopify or Big Commerce. Yeah. You're selling instantly. And they have a consistent consumer experience that's standardized now that people expect. So, you know, it's, it's a very simple checkout. You know, if you don't like that, you want a one-page checkout, you know, it's, it's like $1,000. Now you permanently have a one-page checkout. You yeah. know? So, great way to go. Uh, that, that was not a, a hard decision to make. Well, how do you – the Shopify and Big Commerce is a big debate. How do you decide between the two of those? I'd say if you're heavy in Amazon, go Shopify. If you're heavy everywhere else, go with Big Commerce. Just because the multi-channel, it seems to be better, or yeah, Big Commerce integrates really well with uh, multiple people out there. They've partnered with a ton of people, uh, so no matter what you're using out there, um, if you're using also multi-channel platform management systems like Channel Advisor or anything like that, Big Commerce plugs right in. You know, there's there's a lot of flexibility with them, but their stuff is so clean. I mean, you don't have you don't have bugginess. You don't worry about all that stuff. You just worry about selling, marketing. Uh, and your level of expense that you want to do on that. Yeah. So, Richard, what other uh, software do you recommend and use? So, you use Big Commerce. What else is helpful for you to run your business? Yeah. So, since we do we do multi channels right now, we sell through sixteen different channels. Mm. So, um, I would say that uh, we were reluctant with Channel Advisor, but <laughs> they really are. They're very difficult to get set up. They're yeah. very expensive. Yeah. But if you're doing that many channels, you you sort of have to have them. I mean, to do a custom platform would cost an enormous amount. Um, you know, you're looking at the three, four hundred thousand dollar range. But uh, Channel Advisor is still pretty expensive. But you know, if you're doing that, that's that's where you got to be. So we use them. We also use uh, an in-house uh, mail order manager s- system. We use we just use QuickBooks Enterprise. You know, we're real simple on all that kind of stuff. It works pretty well. I do have an integration person that helps us everything together yeah but um you know as far as software goes those are some of my picks then i've got some other little ones that we use you know like app wise that i'm pretty fond of like That's... i'm a big, big fan of slack right now <laughs> yeah what else do you like yeah um you know you there's slack uh, with the team yeah it's fantastic you know because we were doing a lot of google messaging things like that google talk uh that was keeps kept flying in there People are just using their, their texts and their phones. Now we use Slack for everything. And it's mm-hmm. just it's a great way. You can go back and search it and throw files in it. It's just it's it's pretty addicting actually. Yeah, so, so what else? So Slack, what other apps do you use? Um you know, you know, there's well, I've got my own personal set that I that I'm kind of fond of, but um, uh, if you haven't tried it with Gmail, Google Inbox is is pretty uh, Google pretty cool. Inbox. Yeah, Google Inbox. Hmm. It's for Gmail. I'm not seeing that. Just, just get it. Try it. It, it it's, it's kind of creepy because it reads all your emails, and then it organizes them for you. Really? Yeah. So if huh. you have like travel or something like that, it sends you these travel reminders that are coming up because uh, it read the email the confirmation that you got. So. <laughs> Uh, you can also do reminders in there. You can also use the OK Google function for that to do email or do different reminders for things. You can set yeah. times on them, so you can do that by voice command if you want. Um, all those all those things are set up in there. So in the in the Gmail or the Google inbox, you can actually switch over to nothing but reminders, and it'll just show you an entire list, and you can build tasks out of that, and then throw things in Slack if you want to. Mm-hmm. So I, I use little those are those are productivity apps, but. Yeah. Um, and as far as the business goes, like I said, um, I, I can't say enough good things about big commerce. 
Great team over there. Easy people to work with. They do have medium range platforms now, so it's not just for the small. If you have a small, that's fine. They'll get you going. You can uh, upgrade, no problem. It's the price too is fantastic. So yeah. So it seems like again, like the mail order to magazines to website, and now a lot of platforms are cropping up, like eBay, mm-hmm. Amazon. So talk in the, the channels. So talk about some of the most successful channels for you and and how you navigate those. Yeah, so we started off early on eBay in 2000, and uh, they're probably still one of our strongest partners as it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, eBay's gone through a lot of changes, you know, trying to move from the garage model to the more mainstream marketing platform to now they're trying to go into more of a discovery-based uh, marketplace, whereas yeah. Amazon's more what we call mission-oriented. You know what you want. You're going to use Prime. There it is. I'm buying it. It's coming to my house in two days. Right. So... If you have something you know you want to buy, Amazon's really moving more into that that category. Yeah. eBay's moving more into discovery where I like this kind of thing. I'm looking at it. I'm discovering new things. I'm seeing some other related items. Uh, a really nice structured data setup. They're going to have that completed by the end of the year. So uh, some people who may have turned away from eBay because they didn't feel like they were very friendly to the sellers. They were going more for these big box guys and that kind of thing. Yeah. may want to revisit them and take a look again. They've, they've really positioned themselves closer uh, to more where they want to help the sellers. They partner with the seller. You know, Amazon can compete with you, but eBay still wants to make sure the seller is the one that, that is on the platform first. Mm-hmm. Uh, they won't compete with you. We also sell with uh, Rakuten, which is really interesting. They have a points-based you know, type of system to engage the consumers. So people who like to gain points, do that type of thing. Rakuten has a great selection. They have a nice platform. Uh, Rakuten uh, is kind of like the Amazon of Japan. So they're, they're U.S. They're taking the same things they do that made them successful there in the U.S. They're here. Uh, we also do a lot with Newegg. So Newegg is more of an electronic space. Hmm. But they've also branched out into home goods and other things. So if you're comfortable, if, you know, if you're if you're a tech person, something like yeah. that, you're used to using Newegg a lot. That's what I think of when I think of Newegg, like electronics. But still yeah. like vacuum stuff sells in Newegg. We sell a lot of vacuums there. <laughs> yeah. Huh. So... Uh, just had a big sell with them uh, just recently, so they're uh, they're really a, a they're really a good platform to work with. They generally have a little bit they can you can get a little bit less on the fees there as well. Uh, and of course, one of the new big players is Jet. Yeah. So, what are your thoughts on Jet? I just ordered uh, stuff from Jet. Uh, you did? Yeah. Just I was playing around with it and just ordered some some products on there, and I yeah. thought thought the checkout was pretty seamless actually. It is. So what's yeah. great about there is you can kind of create your own discounts, right? So uh, the discounts are more had on the back end and it's according to your own choices and preferences, you know, as far as shipping goes, you know, what you're comfortable, uh, if you're comfortable with returns, you know, or not, you know, that type of thing. So you can you can create a little more. If you want to throw more stuff in the cart, you can get a little more off, you know, that type of thing. Uh, so they're, they've got a real new concept coming out. Uh, they also have this no seller fee type of thing. So automatically really? there's discounts. Really? No seller fee? There's no seller fees. So how's that possible? <laughs> well, they they wanted to build it off of a, a buying club model. Uh, okay. but they've they've removed those fees on the front end too for now. So I'm not really sure how they're feeding themselves that well, but <laughs> uh, with all the marketing they're doing. But they're they're worth a look. They will vet you, so they, they like pre vetted sellers right now. Yeah. Um so that's that, that's the their kind of thing, but yeah. they're worth checking out. Yeah. Uh, they're getting some momentum right now. Yeah. Um then you've got a lot of other players out there. These are more of those discovery-based sites that I was talking about. Yeah. You've got Touch of Modern, which is a site for men. A lot of cool, sharper image type products there. Yeah. You've got Zulily for women, which is also for kids. You know, right. so if you're uh, their targets like the the mother or the fashion-oriented person. Right. You've got Gilt, uh, Rue La La, all these types of platforms uh, you can become involved with, but they're a little harder to crack into. They're more discovery based, like I said. So, yeah. Um, but there's there's all these different channels: Staples, Wayfair. Um, we just got involved with Walmart.com, so Walmart has become a marketplace now. So they're ready to take mm. on Amazon. Is that harder to crack into, or are they wanting people to to join it? It's another it's another vetting process. You have yeah. to be approved. So if you don't have a strong history, you're probably not going to get into Walmart.com. Yeah. But they um, they grew sixty five percent on their e commerce platform last year, so they had the strongest acceleration wow. of any of the e commerce platforms. 
their, their sites are set squarely on Amazon. Now, they'll never catch them because of the third-party selling, that uh, the way that Amazon does the reporting. But on Amazon proper sales versus Walmart.com sales, Walmart is poised to overtake them. So Really? Yeah. So they're, look for them to be a strong player coming up. Uh, they, they've really been – they've thrown a ton of resources into that platform. So they're, they're very, very serious about it. Yeah. I'm so just impressed, like 16, you know, most people could probably name three channels or, or something, yeah. you know, and, and you're talking 16 channels. What's been the channel that surprised you the most? Like, you know, eBay, obviously, from the beginning, you, you sort of expected it to be bigger and probably Amazon. Which, oh, yeah. one, which one surprised you? One that's probably surprising the most is Zulily. Hmm. Um, Zulily is, like I said, it's a, I heard about them like, Women, clothing, kids, wagons, uh, you know, we're not, we're not going to do well there, right? Uh, but what they do is, this is a new thing. Is there, it Zulily start as a deal site or is it still a deal site? They do deals, but they're also what it would call discovery based. So you may be pulled in by a deal and they start seeing some really cool things that you like. Hmm. The way that they work is uh, they work from the outside in. So they start off by figuring out with their AI what you don't like. And so you stop seeing those things. They don't just go, if you like this, you'll probably like this. It's not like that at all. They'll uh, they get a taste for what a buyer profile is and then slowly start increasing their experience to a scope that they would find palatable. Right. So it's not just a direct product relational thing. It's a data relational thing. And so what they discovered, why we, we sell Dyson there, is because uh, people that buy um, brands such as, like say, Guess or something like that, uh, coach, if they're buying those kind of things, they'll start also serving them up Dysons because those they they found a cross relational data mm. there between those kind of products. Right, and that's what they start serving. So it's really high tech. They they serve over a million different versions of their website a day. Wow, talk no about idea. split testing. Then and then as far as the AB testing goes, they have twelve different studios on their initial floor. They're shooting. All day long, they've got models and stuff in there all day long, trying to figure out what. Uh, when I was there this one day, they had a um, a radio flyer. This was before Halloween. They had a radio flyer wagon, and they they put pumpkins in it and autumn leaves around it for one shot. Then another one, they put a little kid in it, a toddler with a mom looking like she's pulling it. You know, the kid's in a costume for Halloween, right? Right. Uh, then they had another one where it was like. A person was setting some gardening stuff around it, like they're going to have it in the garden for garden stuff. You know, they'll go out and they'll test that against different profiles. Wow. If you fit a certain profile, you'll get served that's a amazing. different look of that, yeah. and somebody else gets served. So, wow, that's remarkable. So the conversion rates are super high, and um, when we started dealing with them, I did not expect us to do well there. And they're they're probably our number three platform right now. Wow, so. Richard, do you remember one of the largest selling single days you've ever had? Yes. And what happened? Um, we had sold a, uh, this was really odd, we'd actually put up a Dyson stick for the lowest price it had ever been sold for. This was on eBay Daily Deals. And uh, I want to say we probably sold over, uh, it was a million dollar day. Wow! So, 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 Holy so, crap! Man, in what's one a day. Dyson? What's a Dyson stick? Uh, Dyson is a stick vac. It's rechargeable, handheld type of deal. It's a, you know kind of small. It's lower priced. And when they first started doing refurbished in those, we had we had one of those. Now they're they're more more prevalent now, but back then it was a pretty big deal. So putting it out at that price, that kind of uh, that kind of item, I was we didn't really see that coming. Wow. And we sold everything we had. So, so you was it logistically really difficult, or like how do you fulfill on your largest day? We're, we're really set up to move, but it took us yeah. three days to to get through that that wood. That was that was that's not <laughs> was bad. Wood to chop. <laughs> that's not bad. I mean, you didn't need to order more product or anything. You had. I did. I did. Oh, did. We couldn't get it because we 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 thought we were, we had you know like a three year supply, but. Uh, <laughs> Selling everything at once like that, that was a... You sold a three-year supply in one day. Well, I'm, I'm joking about the three-year supply, oh, okay. but we literally thought that was probably going to be more like a five- to six-month supply, you know. That's wild. Yep. So how do you replicate that? Well, you can try, but you can't count on that. That, that was d definitely unusual, you know. So uh, it's just one of those things that happens very rarely because uh, everything has to line up just perfectly in the market and everything, you know. So... 
Uh, you can do stuff like that. I mean, there's guys like QVC that do things, you know, like that and don't don't bat an eye. But that's a whole a whole different kind of thing. Just to, to run that through eBay was uh, was pretty exciting. Um, and so the change in retail. When we talked before, I asked, "What do we have to talk about?" and Talk about where you see retail going and the changes. So there's a presentation that I've done before, and I'll just kind of give you the high points yeah. of that. Is it found online? Can someone find it online, or where? Because um, I can no, link, I can I, link it up in the post or something. Is it was it ever videotaped or no? No, this is something that I do privately for for people that uh, that are in our, our market that we're representing or, I or gotcha. we're working with. And so what it basically is is that um, if you so you'll get a new, glimpse into the VIP talk that you that, that you only do for big brands. That's right. This okay. is what you're going to get right, right here. So um, what we see right now is that um, you know these these little guys here, this this right here, yeah, is going to be about a third of retail as soon as 2030. Wow. So. Right now, uh, when I say a third of retail, if people are listening. He held up a mobile phone. So yes, I <laughs> listen to okay, audio so, only. Yeah. yeah, mobile phones. Yeah. Uh, so this is this is the this is the battleground right now is mobile. Yeah. Um, so everything is moving to that. That's why marketplace platforms, guys like Big Commerce, are also where you want to be. Yeah. Rather than doing your own development, because they're they're already preparing for this. Mobile friendly so, sites. Yeah. Uh, right and, now yeah. we're looking at about. Uh, just on eBay alone, a third of the transactions are are through mobile. Wow! But eighty percent are touched by mobile. So that means, at some point in the buying process and the retail process, even offline, people are using mobile. Yeah. Um, for one one reason or another, but the actual purchasing about a third through eBay is coming that way. So right now, retail uh, e-commerce is only about eight to nine. Some say ten percent. It hit ten percent. Of all retail, so ninety percent is still offline. Yeah. Um, really? Yes. Wow. Absolutely. So even though it seems like it's so in your face, it's because you're using it, but you might still be purchasing offline. Mm. There's a lot of things you have to buy offline, though. Yeah. Uh, but they're saying by 2030, the way that the way it's going right now, we're looking at a third of those. So instead of 10 percent, it's going to be 30 percent. Mm. Um, a huge with, increase. Yeah. Right, and with almost all of those transactions being driven by mobile, yeah, almost all of them. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, what's happening with mobile? What we're also seeing is this rise of the the share, the local stuff. You know, the things like Uber, the disruptions in the traditional models. Yeah. It's also happening in retail. So right now, all the major chains which have dominated retail, and I'll say there's probably about seven to eight major ones. We're talking, you know, guys like Macy's, Kohl's. Uh, Walmart, Target, those guys, they've all been on a race to figure out how can they get into this mobile space and get all their products on there to keep people engaged with them yeah. as opposed to somebody else. Yeah. And then there's what we call the pure play guys. The pure play guys are the guys like eBay, like Amazon, where they've never had a retail presence. They've never worked in a traditional retail model. They've only been online. They are light years ahead of everybody else right now. So they're already working on customer experience on a pure mobile environment. How do we do fulfillment? How do we do all this kind of stuff? So they're already there. Uh, the sellers that are doing it, the smaller sellers that have been working in those platforms are already there. So it's one thing to think. If you're a small guy and you're, say, you're, you're doing like you know, $100,000 a year selling whatever it is you're selling, and you're like, man, how am I ever going to compete with these big guys? Well, those big guys are either going to be coming to you pretty soon or you're going to be working in a world ahead of them because – they're spending tons of money. Target's trying to figure out how to turn their stores into fulfillment centers right now because they've never done that kind of fulfillment. Um, Walmart has worked on this third-party marketplace platform. They're, they're light years ahead of everybody else because they want to bring other sellers in to sell for them so they can have this wide array of products they don't have to stock. Right. Amazon's doing all of the above and has been already. Right. <laughs> So people are getting used to that type of experience that Walmart, that uh, that Amazon's providing, that eBay's providing, that these other guys who have been pure play are, are providing. So what does that mean uh, when we talk about a 360 degree view of that? Well, where retail is going, when you see something like Uber, that put the hands away from the cab companies back into the individual consumer, right? Right. So it's all going to be about the individual consumer. Remember, I say well, let's always go back to the, you know, everybody's the user. Yeah. The user. What's in it for me? And what the user wants is choice. They want fast service. And the best way to supply all that's going to be a return to local. So 
everybody likes a local experience too. So once local companies are more web enabled, they're accessed into these things, then guys, there's no need to ship things across the country anymore. What you'll want to do is log in. This is what I want. Here's where I can buy it. Here's a competitive price. I'll get it locally. It'll be over here in a few hours or it'll be here tomorrow or whatever it is you want. Right. Or I can go pick it up. You know, right. or I can return it, or I can do this. People have larger comfort level with people that are local if they were in as, as web enabled as Amazon and eBay and all these guys. So, those big players that are pure play, while these re major retailers are trying to figure out how they can get into web and mobile and do fulfillment, they're going to be a little bit even more behind when it comes time for the local guys to come into play. So, mm -hmm. local niche businesses uh, will have an advantage. Uh, anybody who does local types web services fulfillment, if you know how to ship out of the back of your place, you're way ahead of the game. Hmm. <laughs> so it's eventually coming around, and it's going to come maybe sooner than most people think, where yeah. local will be more inspired than than shipping across the country. Yeah. So as that gets more enabled through apps, through whatever, we're yeah. seeing it now with groceries finally. Groceries are, have been the toughest nut to sure. crack. It's starting to happen now. They've started to figure it out. Yeah. I actually had a, a solution for that because from, from where I came from, I was like the delivery model from pizza driving, right? Right, right. Uh, I was like, hey, here's a real simple solution. Make it so they order at night when they're home. <laughs> so <laughs> so when they're there, and they're like, oh, yeah, then we don't have to leave it on the doorstep. That's right. So imagine leaving a pizza on the doorstep during the day. Yeah, it's got to be hot, right? <laughs> <laughs> So they're overcoming the produce uh, dilemmas, things like that, just by simple changes. Yeah, but what that's also in do doing is it's enabling the the local farmers market guys. It's enabling the uh, organic guys that want to sell their yeah, stuff on. Yeah. So they're they're having an advantage now with that. So it's actually coming back around to small business. You don't have to worry so much about what you're competing with nationally. It helps to learn these things and have these things in place. Be yeah. ready for it. Be ready for mobile. Be ready for uh, platform selling. Because you're going to be on a platform at some point, and there will be a courier coming to pick up your stuff. Yeah. So how do you gear up for mobile now that you know that? People don't even know that. You know that. So what do you do now to get ready for that? Every time you pick up your phone and you use it for anything, think, how, how do I need to be on there? So just think in that mindset. Whether it's your website, like I said, you know, if you go with a platform that's already web enabled or mobile enabled. Yeah. Really important, you know. If you're if you're still trying to build something that you're pinching all the time, you're behind. I see. So just think that always. Uh, if you're doing a listing on eBay, you're going, "Here's my listing. Have you looked at it in mobile? What does it look like in mobile? Make sure it looks good in mobile. Make yeah. sure that they're seeing your description properly. Make sure your your images are lining up just right. Always work from that aspect. If you're working on a desktop, always have your mobile to cross check it. Because that's where it's going. And if you're working there, you're way ahead of the game. So, Richard, I see how that applies directly to vacuum, right? Because you're local and people can, you know, you're ahead of the game. What, if you were to go into e-commerce today, you couldn't do vacuum parts, what would you do? If I was just to jump into e-commerce? Yeah, right now. You're like, like um, you know what you know, but you cannot do any, we didn't even talk about the green, uh, green products at all, uh, but the green steam, but um, what would you do now? No cleaning, no vacuum. This is really simple. Um, knowing what I know, yeah. I wouldn't do a wired product because wired product requires a lot more customer service. Yeah. Uh, you have returns too because they can work, not work. Right. Uh, I would do smaller items that you could ship postal that mm -hmm. you don't have to involve UPS or FedEx with. Mm -hmm. Uh, Postal's very efficient. It's inexpensive, never any problems. So anything you can put in a three-day uh, priority package, yeah, that's that's something you want to try to sell. So it's also lightweight, so you don't have a lot of shipping costs. We still live in the free shipping kind of thing where you know people are having to absorb those costs. Yeah, still so costs like money. One of the worst yeah. things you can possibly sell online. I mean, you, <laughs> it's got a wire coming out of it. You've uh, you've got issues. You have to you have to have people that have to be walk through its use. You've got uh, it's heavy. It's a big giant item. Um, so there's a lot of things that go around that yeah. that you have to deal with. Yeah. But uh, smaller items, you know, something uh, anything that that's that's shippable in a uh, a three day envelope. Yeah. So what, what would be an example? I'm sure that you have ideas every single week. About, I do. So what are what are what's one you could share that you don't think you'll actually do? 
My well, my my secret uh, that I like to actually send up more than anything is vacuum parts. Boy, are the, you, you think vacuums are not sexy? How about vacuum parts? But people need vacuum parts. I'm telling you, you make forty percent on them. They cost nothing to ship. The return rates are very low. So um, I love doing those. So anything in that that range. <laughs> but uh, a lot of people, I know a guy, one of the most successful guys on eBay. He's a friend of mine. Uh, sells cell phone accessories. Hmm. You know, so uh, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Yeah, but you know, it's a competitive competitive arena because a lot of stuff comes out of China there. But anything the along those lines, you can try them. It's inexpensive to yeah. try. Yeah, you know, like I said, if you can fit it in an envelope, I know a lot of successful guys that um, that that go along those lines. Yeah. So, Richard, I have two questions, and I know we're right at the hour, so I don't know if you have time for them or not, because I know you said that you may have to leave right at the top of the hour. So I want to respect your time. So if you have to go, I can wrap it up. If you have time for two more questions, I'd love to, to ask them, but completely up to you. Uh, you have to get to a meeting. I got about, t- I got about 10 minutes now. Oh, okay, perfect. To meeting, so. that, yeah, that's, that's good. So since it's Inspired Insider, I always like to ask what's been the lowest moment business-wise and what's been the proudest moment. You know, because I know it's not always million dollar days type of thing. Right. So what's been right. what's been the lowest moment? Talk about some of the tough times. Yeah. So you know those are, those are always around. Um, the more dynamic, the larger your business gets, that could be a day to day thing. You know. So right. <laughs> just have high and low points during the day. But I'd say you know there was one time where um, we had probably. Uh, you know, you you have somebody that you have to let go and. Yeah. And that's always a that's always a low point, you know, because you get to know them, especially in a small company. Uh, you're like a family, and so there there's been a couple of those where that's had to happen, you know, for various reasons. But uh, but as far as that goes, you know, I don't like to focus on that too much. There's a uh, as far as a high point, high point definitely was when we moved into our new facility. Hmm. Um, Is this the twenty thousand square foot facility or twenty thousand square foot facility? Before that. It looked like we were we had a trailer park going behind that store. I'm telling you, we, we had all these small portable buildings. They were just linked really? together. Every year we'd add a new one, thinking that was the answer to our problems, and then we'd what was it? it. Like, what's the structure look like? Is it like a I'm picturing like a doghouse or something. Like, what is it? Pretty close. Yeah. Um, so so the store was very small up front. It was like just a regular box, you know, that yeah. you'd see a regular storefront. But out back, we had connected. I had a carpenter connect these ten buildings, you know, that we had purchased really cheap. And these things would get super hot in the summertime. And then we started purchasing, uh, you know, truck containers, you know, that that used to fit on the backs of trucks. Mm, I just leave them out there. Just leave them out there, and so a truck would come in for delivery, and we had to hand take everything off and go put it in these individual little storage buildings. And for the space that we had between wow. them, we had wooden structures built. We had a carpenter make these wooden structures. It literally looked like something out of, you know, the Calcutta or something, you know, where you go, don't go in that area. Right, right. <laughs> this is all in the back, and we had it. And um, I remember thinking we were never going to be able to quite get out of there because we were so busy all the time. It's like, how are we going to move all this stuff? How are we going to – well, we finally found this one warehouse facility. We got it built. Um, I remember – I, not even believing we were going to do it once it was finished, and we moved everything in in one weekend. We had this great plan. We logistically figured it out, and we were sitting in there. And I remember just like looking around that day, going like, "I can't believe we're here." You know, it was just like this, this big high point. Yeah. And um, this one guy came over and visited us. And he said, "You know what's going to happen next?" And I was like, "What's that?" He goes. Well, now you're going to go broke buying uh, merchandise because you got room for it. <laughs> it's like, no, no, we know how to run land. And I remember we were stretching the bank account out because, yeah, he was right. You know? So we had all this new inventory. But uh, but just to be in a real facility, it was it was just such a high point. I so mean, how long from the beginning, from 1977, at what point did you move into the 20,000-square-foot facility to give people an idea? That was 2005. Yeah. So literally almost, uh, you know, so now we're, we're working on like year 30. Yeah. Almost but, 30 years, yeah. So we've been here ten, just a little over ten years. Yeah, yeah. What's the toughest part of your job? Uh, toughest part of my job is probably uh, juggling my time now. So uh, it used to be where I could I could get my hands dirty and work on the on the deals and the listings, and I actually like doing that kind of thing. Yeah. But now I'm, now I'm more in the CEO type role, so it's I have to yeah. I have to 
What's your day to day look like? Yeah, what's the day to day look like for you? Uh, so my assistant schedules me, and then I generally will have like uh, at least three or four set meetings. Mm-hmm. And uh, mornings I come in, it's emails and reports, that kind of thing, responses. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we'll head into whatever else has to happen for the day, you know, so finances, that kind of thing. You know, it's stuff you have to deal with, but uh, I still, my favorite thing is, uh, talk, I love talking to guys like you. I also yeah. love uh, talking to uh, to different customers. You know, we, we're dealing with new customers, just getting them on board and, yeah. you know, seeing what we can do for them and helping them out. Yeah. Uh, the other part is that, I really do like still getting at a listing level and looking at things yeah. and uh, and trying to figure out how we can tweak things to make yeah. that, that experience better. Yeah. So yeah. best part about working with your dad? Um, <laughs> you know, the best part is getting actually to see him every day and getting to be with him because uh, I know that a lot of people can't do that. You know, they don't, they don't see their parents, much less get to work with them. Yeah. And uh, the only downside to that is my poor mother suffers. So, <laughs> does she come in? I mean, it sounds like your I grandparents were in the business see at some my point. my mother because you know I'm always with my dad. So the last thing on the weekend is, <laughs> do I want to go see my mom? No, my dad, I don't want to see him. Yeah. But um, so she suffers from that. But but it is a it's it's a blessing to get to actually be and see your your parents every day. Yeah. So what should we leave people with? We talked about a lot of different things, very valuable things. Richard, what should we leave people with? Um, Let's say like an e-commerce I'm... business is, you know, looking for whatever edge or advice. Yeah, always, always go at things like I said. My pers- go from the perspective of the user. If you find out something that, that the user is looking for, they're wanting or they're needing, even this the, uh, just a little something different from somebody else, that's a huge edge. Yeah. Um, just a reason for someone to click on you instead of somebody else. You know, there's there's lots of ways to do it. Always always keep looking for that. My own personal thing is I always tell people there's there's two things I'll say actually is um, you you will try five things before you find one thing that works. Keep trying things is the key. Yeah. Keep trying things even if they're stupid or you think they're dumb or it's what just just keep doing it. The other thing is is that uh, I've always found in my own personal life that I would rather have somebody besides myself tell me no. So, you know, when you hit those walls, hit those walls. That's fine. But sometimes we, we like to inside ourselves go, oh, I don't think that's going to, I don't think I should do that. I oh, see. I so just try so it and try it. And see so what the stop feedback yourself is. More often than anybody else will. Yeah. What was one of those breakthroughs? You said you tried five things and one finally worked. Do you remember one of those? Um, I think that, one that you maybe almost gave up, but you're like, oh, we'll just try one more thing. <laughs> Um, well, you know, I, I'll tell you, well, on a, on a recent level, I was sitting there going, you know, I, everybody was kind of wanting to give up on this one platform. They're like, I don't know about Newegg, you know, if you're trying, I was like, you know what, let's really get, let's really get behind it and just give them a shot. You know, let's, Mm. let's give them what they're asking for. Let's move them ahead of the queue and see if it takes time, energy and effort to to do that. You know, when you decide to, yeah, that's right. And so we, uh, we tried a bunch of things that hadn't worked already. On an individual basis, they tried an all-in-one approach that let's try this, this, and this. I said, let's go for it. And uh, boom, they had we had record sales with them last week. So wow. that's a recent thing. Nice. Um, so like I said, sometimes, you you know, don't don't let context go either. Don't don't let an idea go. Sometimes things circle back around too. Yeah. You know, just because it was denied or it wasn't a good idea at that time, yeah. don't trash it. Keep it in the back pocket because you never know. Situations change. The markets change. People change. Management changes. Everything yeah. changes. Yeah. And all of a sudden, an idea that someone wasn't receptive to, they may be receptive to it now or, or really wanting it. So yeah. you may have just been, you know, your instincts may have been correct at, at that moment, but it just wasn't the right time. Right. So, so uh, never let those things go. Keep trying on everything. Don't be afraid of failure. Failure's always, you know, the way I always look at that is, I go, that's just your lesson to success. So, I mean, right, right. You know, just keep hammering away at it. Yeah. So where should we send people to check out if they want a vacuum vacuum part or some green <laughs> products? We abcvacuumwarehouse.com. And then the other site is Greensteam, but it's spelled G-R-U-E-N-E-S-T-E-A-M.com. Right. Green, like like Greensteam. That's, right. you know, that's like, right. it's, like, it's actually green in Texas. Yeah. If you're in Texas, that's we, we pronounce it green. So. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Richard, this has been absolutely fantastic. I really appreciate your time and expertise with everything. Absolutely. I really enjoyed it. Yeah.